This is one chapter of a lengthy DVD we offer on the Santa Fe with a deep dive into passenger trains and war bonnets. The Santa Fe became a pioneer in using diesels during the Depression years. They learned of the speed and the endurance potential possessed by diesels that also held the promise of greatly lowered fuel and maintenance costs. The Santa Fe line had many miles of track with limited supplies of usable water and the thirsty steam engine created many extra expenses maintaining these water supplies. As the U.S. western cities were coming out of the Great Depression, the Japanese conquest of China and other Asian countries and the European War was about to involve the U.S. Even a few years before the U.S. involvement, rail traffic started to pick up as the U.S. prepared for what seemed inevitable. started for the U.S. in December of 1941, and the railroads were a vital part of our success. The Santa Fe played a key role in moving the materiel of war, with men and women in uniform westward to the Pacific Theater. The traffic levels nearly doubled, and the pinch for railroad workers was felt by all railroads, but lost many to the military service. The Santa Fe had already started to dieselize in a big way, and they had a roster of over 320 FTs by the war's end. The diesels and steam power could both showcase their abilities during the pressures of war traffic, and the diesel won that contest for itself. Steam would be all replaced by 1957 on the Santa Fe. The Santa Fe's connection of Chicago to the California coast gave a well-kept corridor for war goods flooding out of the east and the Midwest. It also brought soldiers and sailors from all parts of the country, many of whom were venturing away from home for the first time. After the war's end, business for all railroads dropped off dramatically, but the 50% discount rate for the military ended. The Santa Fe estimated that it lost nearly $200 million in revenue during the war due to an old law concerning wartime rail pricing. The biggest lesson of the war for the Santa Fe was to find ways to improve operating efficiency and reduce labor costs. No single item would bring this change as well as a complete and rapid dieselization. The war's end brought the Santa Fe a public eager to travel, and on something nicer than a troop train with worn out, unair conditioned heavyweight era cars. The Santa Fe invested in passenger travel once again, and the lighter cars and more efficient diesels made rail travel a more exciting and inviting experience. And for a while longer, the Santa Fe could compete with a growing airline passenger industry, which gave the option of trading comfort for speed. The American public would eventually have access to cars capable of making long trips with comfort and reliability on roads closely paralleling Santa Fe tracks. The Santa Fe always had a reputation for speed. This reputation was crystallized in 1905 by the colorful and wealthy Western figure, Death Valley Scotty, who paid the Santa Fe $5,500 to run a special train from Los Angeles to Chicago in less than 46 hours. The stunt turned out to be great publicity for the Santa Fe. The skillful marketing people of the Santa Fe sold their tickets on the idea that they had the fast track from Chicago to the California coast. Chicago was the nation's railroad hub with a multitude of connections to the east. Speed was marketed with the beauty of the southwest, making getting there a large part of the attraction. The frequent use of the American Indian as an icon of that beauty was reflected in Santa Fe advertising art as well as the decor inside passenger cars and stations. This influence was complete down to the stylized replication of the Indian headdress known as the war bonnet. The most familiar face in the public's railroading awareness was this one, especially in the red and silver war bonnet colors used by the Santa Fe for passenger locomotives. This is the diesel that permanently elbowed steam aside on main lines everywhere in the U.S. This is the diesel that outsold every other make and model available in the 1940 to 1950 era. 
Beginning with the FT model, the F-Series diesel proved the very idea of eliminating the high maintenance aspects of steam power. The Santa Fe could run a set of diesel engines through multiple divisions and only the crews would need changing, whereas steam power would be changed out for water, fuel, and ash cleaning. From 1940 to 1959, the U.S. railroads, including Santa Fe's competitors, bought over 7,500 F-Series EMD diesels. Most F-units were built as the 1,500-horsepower F-7 model. Here's a breakdown of Santa Fe units purchased. The red and silver war bonnet units were assigned to passenger service, and the more business-like appearance was for freight. Let's go to the Los Angeles, California Union Station and look at the eastbound Santa Fe Chief at some locations that have either changed or disappeared altogether. This station dates to 1939 when the Union Pacific, Southern Pacific, and Santa Fe all relocated their trains to one common terminal. This sprawling facility is a stub-in terminal and trains cannot run through. The tracks dead end at Aliso Street. The Santa Fe chief would leave the LA Union passenger terminal at 11.30 a.m. and move out through the maze of tracks in the yard throat area. The tower to the right is the terminal tower. Past the yard throat is Mission Tower that controls all trains in, out, and past the terminal. This E9-powered Union Pacific train is about to run by the south face of the Mission Tower and head to Riverside, California on UP tracks that partly follow the east bank of the LA River. Pacific will use Santa Fe tracks from Riverside to Daggett, California to get past the famous Cajon Pass. We'll visit Cajon later on to see joint Santa Fe and UP action. The Santa Fe tracks peel off to the northeast for the Pasadena subdivision on the north side of the Mission Tower. The Santa Fe Chief will run along the west bank of the LA River and cross the river. Santa Fe tracks also run compass south along the LA River West Bank to Redondo Junction. We'll see their San Diego service passenger trains on the San Bernardino subdivision also. The LA River Bridge, shown here, was removed in the 90s after the Santa Fe closed the Pasadena subdivision. This line was sold to Metro Rail to be a future extension of their blue line from LA Union Terminal out to Sierra Madre. Each scene here was shot on film on a different day, so you'll see a variety of F3 and F7 units with a good representation of unit numbers. The green flags on number 325 indicate a second section train is following the chief. The 
The old Highland Park station once occupied this siding, but it was already a victim of progress by this date. We'll follow this line out to the Pasadena station, which no longer serves passenger trains. Much of what you see here is gone and only the roadbed remains. One happy exception is the famous bridge over the Arroyo Seco that was built in 1896. It will be part of the Blue Line metro system, scheduled to open by 2002 after a number of delays. This is really creeping along due to the many grade crossings and the tracks meandering through residential areas. By now, some of the passengers are wondering about Santa Fe's reputation for speed. Once out on the desert, this train will more than make up for any dawdling here. Pacific ran a branch line out this way, and the track curving to the right is the UP line that once ran north to Linda Vista. This is South Pasadena, with some industries that still needed rail freight service at the time. We finally reach the Pasadena station, which is long closed. For decades, many famous people and Hollywood stars used the station to avoid the crowds at the downtown station. This is the Colorado Boulevard crossing, a road made famous by the annual New Year's Rose Parade, and it was also a small portion of the old Route 66. These F units proved their point to the Santa Fe, and many would stay on the system into the 70s. They were also an important part of establishing Santa Fe's good reputation, and they lasted long enough to bring the Santa Fe to the end of their involvement in the passenger business. This train looks like a Santa Fe train, but it's actually a 1971 view after Amtrak assumed almost all passenger train operation in the U.S. Eventually, Amtrak trains seen on Santa Fe tracks would have new SDP-40 locomotives from EMD, and the F units would be retired by the mid-70s. The Amtrak look would take hold more and more, and Santa Fe even began painting the F units in a yellow war bonnet scheme to distance them further from their involvement with passenger trains. So 
Santa Fe continued to invest in new equipment, such as full-length dome cars, and they maintained their standards of service. Through the late 60s and into the 70s, the financial losses associated with passengers were carried. Some people still traveled to see the beauty and enormity of the country out west on vacations. But there was a loss of business travel on the long-distance trains due to the domination of air travel. Overall, the Santa Fe had good patronage on its trains and the money loss wasn't from the empty seat problem many other railroads had. The problems were with the heavy expenses keeping the equipment up to standards and the labor-intensive nature of catering to passengers, especially on long-distance trains traveling thousands of miles. In the declining years, some railroads treated passengers as self-loading freight, but the Santa Fe did not. They realized that a satisfied vacationing passenger could be a potential shipper of freight goods. Quality service and keeping of schedules on a passenger train would be an indication of how his freight would be handled. By 1967, the famous Fred Harvey service was pulled from the Santa Fe dining cars. Years before, the Harvey Company ran restaurants once well represented by the one at Barstow Station. This station once featured full dining and lodging. Passenger trains also depended on express package and mail revenue to help pay for expenses. The loss of these government contracts by 1967 and the slow demise of the Railway Express Agency would also contribute to the overall decline of passenger trains in the U.S. Here we see the Santa Fe's eastbound Grand Canyon with an interesting mix of head-end equipment. This is the westbound counterpart, probably in the winter of 1965. During World War II, the locomotive manufacturers were controlled by the War Production Board. EMD was allowed to build road locomotives, but ALCO was restricted to building switch engines. This put ALCO at a disadvantage when the war was over, and they went after the lucrative road locomotive market. They introduced what some still consider to be the most handsome diesel ever built in the U.S., the Alco PA series. The Santa Fe bought 44 Alco PAs from 1946 to 1948 for passenger service. The PAs could outperform the EMDs in mountain territory with their conservatively rated General Electric traction motors. The addition of turbocharging put them years ahead of EMD, who relied solely on Roots blowers for supercharging until their turbocharged GP20 was introduced in 1962. Unfortunately, Alcos suffered from crankshaft and turbocharger failures in their early models, and they essentially lost the passenger locomotive market to EMD by the 50s. The EMDs proved to be more reliable since they had those critical war years to refine engineering bugs without much in the way of competition. The Santa Fe used Alco PAs until the mid-60s on the San Diegan local. As you can see, the San Diegan attracted a good deal of business from the local surfers, school groups, and sightseers headed to San Diego.
Time ran out for the PAs a few years sooner than for the EMDF units. The Santa Fe PAs would be retired first and stored away for sale or scrapping. Some of Santa Fe's Alcos would be sold to the Delaware and Hudson in 1967, and they in turn sold them in 1978 to the Ferro Carrillo del Pacifico in Mexico. In 1967, Santa Fe bought nine FP-45s to help the fleet of F units that were showing signs of their age. The FP-45s were the finest locomotives EMD or anyone else had to offer. The FP-45s had a fully enclosed cowl body and an extra five feet of length to house a steam boiler in the rear to support the passenger car's heating systems. These were a big hit when they were opened for inspection at San Bernardino's yard. At nearly 400,000 pounds each, they also were the best dressed of all the 20-cylinder SD-45 based locomotives. Santa Fe was willing once again to invest money in the passenger business, even though Amtrak was less than four years away. The FP-45s would continue to outrun automobiles on the government-subsidized highways alongside Santa Fe's hot double-track mainline in the southwest. Some say that the Santa Fe considered keeping passenger trains out of the Amtrak system as a matter of corporate pride and also as a measure of control over what would use Santa Fe's tracks. Eventually, they did bow out of the passenger business and placed Amtrak trains on Santa Fe rails, but the FP-45s finished the job for Santa Fe. Let's take one last train ride on the Pacific Rail Society chartered Snowflake Special, looking back nostalgically to the winter of 1970. The train ride crossed the Colorado River into Arizona, and we get a glimpse of the pinnacles that gave the town of Needles its name. The Santa Fe was appreciated by all for its spaciousness, comfort, and a great view just right for casual photography. The trip left Santa Fe's main line at Katy's to use the branch line now owned by the Arizona and California Railroad.
the owners of the two SPV map books that cover California and Arizona can trace these locations and many others shown in this video by looking up the place names in the back to find the appropriate map page. The Phoenix subdivision was also toured up to Williams, Arizona. These composite impressions show a Santa Fe that was on the eve of great changes with the end of Santa Fe's passenger trains, war bonnets, and many other items that would be missed by fans and employees alike. Twenty long years after this trip, we saw a revitalized Santa Fe with both new EMD and GE power in the traditional war bonnet scheme once again, which served them right to the end. For much more, look for item D117 on our website for the full DVD feature. And thanks for watching.